Okay, um, welcome to chapter 26 where we begin our discussion of the urinary system. One of the things we have to understand about the, the job of blood in the body is that it has to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cells that need it in order to survive, but at the same time it also has to remove waste products that accumulate around the cells as they metabolize, and this includes carbon dioxide and also the nitrogenous waste such as ammonia, urea, and uric acid. Without this function, cells will quickly find themselves in a perturbed pH. The um, membrane potential would um, begin to change to the point where the cells wouldn't be able to function, and more than that, proteins would begin to denature, and the chemical reactions they carry out would essentially halt. So one of the most important jobs of the urinary system is to remove these waste products because in general, when you're talking about nitrogen-containing organic compounds, these tend to be uh, basic in nature, and they just can't be allowed to accumulate. In addition to that, um, other roles for the urinary system include electrolyte and fluid balance, as well um, as the aforementioned waste disposal and regulation of pH. It also plays an important role, as we'll find out, in the production of red blood cells. So let's begin with our discussion of the urinary system. The job primarily is to filter the blood and the three processes that go into cleaning the blood are filtration, which happens primarily in a specialized structure in the kidney tubule called the Bowman's capsule, inside of which sits a cluster of capillaries called the glomerulus. Reabsorption, which is the removal of useful solutes from the filtrate that enters, enters the kidney tubules, which will eventually become urine, and secretion of toxins into the urine so that we can dispose of them. It also is important in the regulation of blood volume and blood pressure, regulating the concentration of a variety of electrolytes, as well as regulating pH, and plays a role, of course, in erythropoiesis and the synthesis of vitamin D, which is important in, among other things, the mineralization of bone. The system's relatively simple. Two kidneys on the posterior body wall lying about halfway down. Uh, the last two floating ribs cover the posterior aspect of each kidney. Um, they, of course, are um, beneath the, uh, the liver. And they don't have a lot of protection. Um, they're held in place by connective tissue. And a blow to the lower back in the region where the kidneys are attached could potentially dislodge the organ and result in irreparable damage. The ureters conduct the urine that's created in the kidneys down to the bladder, and of course the urethra brings the urine from the bladder to the outside world. They're located behind the peritoneum, so they're termed retroperitoneal organs on the posterior body wall on either side of the vertebral column. The lumbar vertebrae and the rib cage partially protect them, but really that's not a lot of protection. Um, the right kidney lies slightly lower than the left due to, again, the presence of the liver on top of it. Um, they're surrounded externally by a capsule, which is fibrous connective tissue around each kidney. There's also a fat pad that protects each of the organs. This basically uh, encircles the renal capsule and cushions it. And there's fascia, which is a thin layer of loose connective tissue that serves to anchor the kidney to the surrounding tissues that support it. The hilum is the little indentation on the medial side of each kidney where the renal artery, veins, nerves enter and leave the kidneys. And they open into the renal sinus, which is a cavity that's filled with fat and loose connective tissue. And here you can see the location of the kidneys in the uh, abdominal pelvic region. Uh, we've got uh, one on each side, and you can see that they lie at about the level of the first floating rib and then really the bottom half of the kidney isn't well protected at all. If you look at this transverse section you can see how close the kidneys lie um, to the dorsal aspect and this is one of the reasons why in boxing and ultimate fighting and, and contact sports it's generally termed illegal uh, for somebody to um, send a blow to the lower back because of the danger potentially of dislodging these organs. In fact, in boxing, this is termed a kidney punch, and it is absolutely um, not allowed. Here you can see the internal anatomy. This is a sagittal cut through the kidney. 
showing you a lot of the internal features as well as the blood supply. The cortex is the outer layer of the kidney that lies beneath the capsule and above the medulla. The renal columns are cortical tissue that radiate between each of these structures which are called the renal pyramids which have this sort of striated appearance to them. The medulla is where the pyramids reside and they surround the renal sinus. The pyramids are cone shaped. The base is the boundary between the cortex and medulla and the apex is the renal papilla and this is where the urine is extruded into the minor calyx from there into the major calyx and from there into the renal pelvis which is going to empty eventually into the ureter. Um, the calyces are little cup shaped structures that collect the urine as it flows out of the renal papilla. Um, the major calyces converge to form the renal pelvis which is the enlarged chamber that's formed by the major calyces. The ureter exits at the hilum and it connects to the urinary bladder. Um, important thing to understand about the ureter, although um, it has some elasticity to it due to the fact that you'll find transitional epithelia lining the lumen of the ureter, uh, it is considerably narrower than the urethra. Okay, and This will come into play when we talk a little bit later about the production of kidney stones. Okay, the nephron is the filtration unit of the kidney. Um, the parts include the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, which is sometimes abbreviated the PCT, the loop of Henle, which has a descending and an ascending limb, and then the distal convoluted tubule, sometimes abbreviated the DCT. These will empty into the collecting ducts. Okay, from the DCT, the urine flows into the collecting duct from here to the papillary ducts, then to the minor calyces, the major calyces, and then finally into the renal pelvis. The collecting ducts and parts of the loops of Henle and the papillary ducts lie entirely in the medulla. The juxtamedullary nephrons and the cortical nephrons are what populate the kidney. We're going to discover that the juxtamedullary nephrons, which make up about 15 percent of the total nephrons in each kidney, have the job primarily of um, establishing the salt gradient in the medulla which is going to be critical in adjusting the volume of urine as it passes through the collecting duct particularly on its way ultimately to the minor calyx and then the renal pelvis and ureter. The remaining 85 percent of the nephrons which are cortical nephrons are primarily there for detoxification purposes and you can see the two classes here, the cortical nephrons on the right, the juxtamedullaries on the, on the left. The main difference between the two is the length of the loops of Henle and also the arrangement of the peritubular capillaries which are termed vasorecta in the juxtamedullary nephrons and peritubular capillaries in the case of the cortical. Um, the renal corpuscle is near the periphery of the cortex um, in these um, nephrons, the loops of Henle do not extend deep into the medulla when we're referring to the cortical, uh, as you can see. But one of the things that you'll notice as we discuss um, the arrangement of structures in the medulla is that you see parallel um, arrangements of loops of Henle, peritubular capillary, vasorecta, and collecting ducts, and this is what gives the medulla particularly the pyramids, their striated appearance. When you cut the kidney open in lab, you'll be able to see that very clearly. The renal corpuscle is the Bowman's capsule plus the capillary bed, which is termed the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is unique because it's one of the few capillary beds in the body where um, blood pressure remains reasonably high. And the reason for this is in part due to the different diameter of the blood vessels that bring blood into the glomerulus and those that exit. The afferent arteriole, as you can see here, has a much wider diameter than the efferent and this serves to keep a relatively high blood pressure um, constantly and part of the way that the um, production of urine is controlled is through changing the diameters of these afferent and efferent arterioles in order to uh, maintain or accelerate or decelerate the production of filtrate which will eventually become urine. The Bowman's capsule has an outer parietal layer which is simple squamous epithelium 
and a visceral layer made up of podocytes that encircle the glomerular capillaries and are part of what we call the filtration membrane in the glomerulus. The glomerulus itself is just a network of capillaries enclosed inside the Bowman's blood enters via the afferent arterial and exits via the efferent arterial where it then heads to the peritubular capillaries in the case of cortical nephrons and the vasorecta in the case of the juxtamedullary nephrons. Now um, notice that um, you've got essentially some of the early structures of the, of the nephron in this inset, in this figure. This is the Bowman's capsule. This is the glomerulus inside it. Filtration occurs as the blood is forced into the glomerulus. Solutes smaller than a certain molecular weight will cross the filtration membrane, enter Bowman's, and from there head into the proximal convoluted tubule, where primarily the process of reabsorption will take place. Here, um, a lot of nutrients, water, and electrolytes are recovered. Um, the nutrients are important because the cells need them for energy. We don't want to dispose of them in the urine. And the waste products tend to remain in the filtrate. From the proximal convoluted tubule, we head down into the descending limb of the loop of Henle, you can see here. And then we'll make a hairpin turn at the base of the, um, or at the apex of the pyramid in the juxtamedullary nephrons and about midway down the pyramid in the case of corticals and we'll head back up into the ascending limb. From there we'll go into the distal convoluted tubule shown here. Notice that it makes um, sort of a, a detour. It stops very close to the, um, the arterioles that serve the glomerulus and then it empties directly into the collecting duct as shown here. Okay. The parietal layer is the outer simple squamous epithelium that becomes cube-shaped uh, where Bowman's capsule ends and the PCT begins, while the visceral layer are the podocytes that wrap around the glomerular capillaries. Other components of the filtration membrane, as we're going to find out, include the capillary endothelial cells and the basement membrane. It's these three layers together that preclude the movement of large substances such as plasma proteins like albumin and also formed elements from making its way into the filtrate that ends up in Bowman's. Fenestrae are window-like openings in the endothelial cells of the glomerular capillaries and the filtration slits are the gaps between the processes of the podocytes. The basement membrane is between the endothelial cells and the podocytes and serves to complete now the entire filtration membrane. So these are the components you can see listed here. The capillary endothelial cells, basement membrane, and podocytes restrict the types of substances that can enter the filtrate. Um, remember that it's the, the net filtration pressure that's going to drive substances through the glomerular capillaries and into Bowman's. And we're going to find out that the net filtration pressure is comprised both of the net osmotic pressure on either side of the capillary as well as the net hydrostatic pressure. The afferent arteriole is what supplies the blood to the glomerulus while the efferent drains it. The afferent is much wider in diameter than the efferent. That's how you can tell them apart. Both vessels have a layer of smooth muscle that's capable of vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And this is very important because this helps us to control glomerular filtration rate, which is often abbreviated GFR. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is where renin is produced. The juxtaglomerular cells are smooth muscle in the afferent arteriole where the latter enters the Bowman's capsule, and the macula densa are specialized tubule cells in the distal tubule which lies between the afferent and the efferent arterioles. The macula densa juxtaglomerular cells make up the juxtaglomerular apparatus. The juxtaglomerular apparatus job is to control the GFR, okay, in part in response to changes in blood pressure, also in change to changes in osmolarity. If we look at the different parts of the nephron, one of the things that we have to understand about it is that the nephron is not one continuous tube 
from start to finish. The cells that make it up are different in different regions. You're going to find different cells in the PCT, then in the descending, then in the ascending limb, and in the in the uh, in the DCT. So you could think of the the nephron itself as a quilt of cells stitched together, and different parts of the quilt do different jobs. The proximal tubule is simple cuboidal epithelium with microvilli present for increasing surface area, and the reason for this is that there's a considerable amount of um, filtration, or I'm sorry, of absorption and secretion that goes on in the PCT. Um, okay, one of the things that we have to appreciate about the nephron is that it's not one continuous tube made up of a single type of cell all along its length. Because different parts of the tube perform different tasks, the cells that populate them are going to be slightly different. So you're going to see different cells in Bowman's versus the proximal convoluted tubule versus the descending versus the ascending and the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron. They're all going to have slightly different morphologies and they're going to have different distribution of pumps and channels and they do different jobs. So if we look at the proximal convoluted tubule, you'll find primarily simple cuboidal epithelium with a lot of microvilli. The purpose, of course, of the microvilli is to increase the available surface area um, because there's a lot of reabsorption that takes place in this region of the nephron. The loops of Henle have a descending and an ascending limb. The descending limb is the first part, which is similar to the PC2. The latter part, the thin portion of the descending limb, is simple squamous epithelium. It's quite thin and it is extremely water permeable and that's very important when we get to the function of the nephron later on. The ascending limb is the first part. Um, it's simple squamous epithelium, kind of a continuation of what we saw in the descending limb, but the latter part is simple cuboidal epithelium and what we're going to find in this region of the tube is that a lot of sodium chloride pumping goes on as we remove salt from the filtrate and send it into the medullary portion of the kidney. The distal convoluted tubule is shorter than the proximal and made up of simple cuboidal epithelium, but these are smaller cells with very few microvilli. A significant amount of secretion goes on here. Toxins are stolen from the blood and put into the filtrate. There is also a considerable amount of reabsorption. A lot of water and electrolytes are absorbed in the distal convoluted tubule as well. The collecting ducts form where the distal convoluted tubules come together. They're larger in diameter, lined with a simple cuboidal epithelium, and they run from the medullary rays and lead into the papillary ducts, which are going to dump, of course, into the minor calyces, from there to the major calyces, from there to the renal pelvis, and, of course, next the ureter. These are the arteries and veins that serve the kidney. It's important to understand the blood flow through the kidney. When you think about what the kidney has to do, it's about the size of a bar of soap, and it filters uh, hundreds of liters of blood a day and generates just uh, a few liters of filtrate. And if you think about the load that is on a day-in, day-out basis, um, it really is a marvel of engineering what the kidney is able to do. When you compare it to a similar device that we use as a kidney substitute, which is a dialysis machine, which if you've ever seen one is about the size of a standard refrigerator and has to take between four to eight hours to clean the blood in the entire body. The arterial supply runs from the renal arteries that branch off either side of the abdominal aorta. These fork into segmental arteries which branch into interlobars that run up the renal columns and into the cortex where they break around the base of the pyramids forming the arcuate arteries. And from there um, there are arteries that sort of radiate off of the arcuates and depending on which textbook you you use they'll either be called interlobular arteries or cortical radiate arteries. Two names for the same thing basically. Off of these interlobular arteries are going to be the afferent arterioles which are going to directly serve the glomerulus. The part of the circulation involved with urine formation is really near or really tightly associated with the kidney tubules. The afferent arterioles supply blood to the glomerulus. 
which is the site of blood filtration. The efferent arterioles exit the renal corpuscle and then feed into the peritubular capillaries, which are in close association with the uh, loop of Henle and the DCT and PCT. The vasa recta are specialized parts of the peritubular capillaries that we find in juxtamedullary nephrons that run deep into the medulla along the extensive loops of Henle that the juxtamedullary nephrons possess and are important primarily in water balance. As the blood is cleaned, it goes back into the venous return. The venous drainage includes peritubular capillaries that drain into interlobular veins and lead to arcuate veins, from there to interlobar veins, and then out through the renal veins. Here we can see the processes that are involved in urine production, sort of as an overview. Nephrons are considered the functional unit of the kidney. You've got a million or so in each kidney. The smallest structural component for filtering the blood um, has a tremendous task with, um, assigned to it every day, which is the cleaning of all the blood in the body. Filtration occurs primarily in the Bowman's capsule, where sub, sub, any solute smaller than a certain molecular weight will cross the filtration membrane and become part of the filtrate. Reabsorption is the process of recovery of the useful solutes, bringing them back into the blood supply, while secretion is the process of removing toxins from the blood and placing them into the filtrate, which will eventually become the urine. And we'll get into a lot more detail regarding these processes next time we meet up. Um, make sure and study this material as it will be covered on an upcoming PRS, and I will see everybody in class. Thank you for joining me today.